John chapter 16 this morning, John chapter 16, verses 25 through 33. In time of my sermon this morning, be of good cheer, be of good cheer. Now, as we come to this text, it is the early hours of Friday morning, past midnight, the day of the Lord Jesus Christ, the day in which he will be crucified. Our Lord is going to uh, give his disciples his last few words here. Uh, the words that he gives them on the Thursday night of Passion Week, the night before his crucifixion started all the way back in chapter 13 of John and uh, are following up through chapter 16. So it's a long discord that our Lord Jesus has given his disciples. He's made them feel uh, all kind or he's made them all kinds of promises. He's given them all kinds of warnings and they have gone through all kinds of ups and downs emotion and wise. So this is a, a, a bleak kind of moment for the disciples here. Jesus is telling him that, or telling them that he's going to leave. In other words, that he's going to the cross, he's going to die. But not only that, he's telling them that when he leaves and when he goes and uh, is crucified and, and uh, risen and gone to heaven, then things are going to get worse for them. So in other words, because they hated him, they're going to hate the disciples. So he's telling them things are going to get far worse for you. So even in this world in which we live today, obviously is bleak and filled with fearful people who are struggling to make some sense of life. Their fears are personal, they're private, they're individual, but they're all so collective. Even in the midst of all the material prosperity and all of this supposed freedom, we are engulfed in fears and anxieties and doubts and also questions. And they're is a kind of cosmic dread, in other words, or that, that kind of looms in the, in the lives of people today. People are searching for things and giving, or, or searching for meaning of life. They're in despair. They're consumed with all kinds of problems in their life. But not only that, they're consumed with selfishness, self-centeredness, because that's the way they've been taught by the things of the world. They find themselves unable to be satisfied. So how can we overcome? How can the world overcome? How can we be, as I've given you the title today, be of good cheer? How can we be of good cheer? Well, we're going to find that out here in verses 25 through 33 of John chapter 16. Look what it says. These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs, but the time cometh. When I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. At that day you shall ask in my name, and I, shall not, uh, and I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you. For the Father himself loveth you, because you have loved me and have believed that I come out from God. I come forth from the Father and have come unto the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. His disciples said unto him, Lo, now speakest thou plainly, and speak, speakest no proverbs. Now are we sure that thou knowest all things, and needest not that any man should ask thee. By this we believe that thou canst uh, came forth from God. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, the hour is come, Ye is, yea, it is now come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone, and yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Let us pray. Father in heaven, again, we thank you for the day and all the blessings. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for this time to be here, Lord. We ask your sweet spirit, Lord, to speak to us today. Fill this room, Lord Jesus. Father, we pray if there's one here lost today, that maybe something be done here. A song, a song sung, uh, the, the scripture, Lord, read, the preaching of the word that may prick their heart, Lord, that the Holy Spirit may grab them and bring them to a saving knowledge before it's everlasting too late. Lord, that's our prayer. That's our desire. Father, I ask you to hide me behind the cross. I know I am nothing, Lord. But thank God, through the Spirit of God, Lord Jesus, souls can be changed. Lives can be changed through this preaching of the Word. Father, we love you. We thank you for this day. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. 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 Be of good cheer. We see here start to start with that there is help through the Holy Spirit of God. Now we have seen in these chapters and in these verses uh, for the last few months a lot of talk from God about the Holy Spirit. We have been taught who He is. We have been taught what He does. So we have learned a lot in these few chapters here about the Holy Spirit of God. The Lord has sent the Holy Spirit the day of Pentecost after His resurrection and ascension to the Heavenly Father. And the job for that Holy Spirit is to teach us. It is to lead us. It is to guide us in all things our Lord and Savior. So the Lord Jesus says here that He is going to show us plainly the Father. He's saying He's going to continue His teaching. The, these things he says, and it refers to everything that he has taught them, not only in these few verses, but in the last three years. Everything that he has uh, taught to his disciples, he's going to say here, that he's going to teach, he's going to show you these things. But what are they about? So let's look again, as we look there at, at the scriptures there, verse 25. It says, these things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs. But, they come, but, that, but the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. Now all the things that Jesus come teaching, what was it about? These things. It was about the Father. It's all about the Father. At, at, the, at the end of verse 25, plainly of the Father. These words used for plainly, as, or this word used as a strong. It, it's something that, uh, it, it, it means to be bold. It means to uh, speech with, uh, without concealing anything or passing over anything. It's just a bold-faced truth. He said, I plainly teach you of the Father. It's all about the Father that Jesus has come. It's about the Father that uh, uh, He's given His life for you and I uh, because He loves the Father. He has been revealing God and will continue to do so to you and I. And that word Proverbs there is translated figuratively language, in other words. It refers to language where the, the meaning does not uh, lay on the surface, but must be searched for. And there are many instances, and Jesus gave his disciples words that they didn't quite understand, actions that he did, mysteries that took place that the disciples didn't quite understand. But now through the Holy Spirit of God, he's going to plainly make it known to them. And it's all about the Father. It's all about God. So the Lord recognized their confusion uh, over many of these things that he had, he had said. And he promised a time in the near future where he would speak about the Father in a way that they would plainly understand. So in spite of their present spiritual uh, confusion at this time, these disciples, he's given them hope for a future. A, a time of spiritual growth. He's going to teach them plainly, he says. The hour is coming, referring to the time after Jesus had completed his atoning work. In other words, the hour is coming after he is beaten, after he is crucified, after he's laid in the grave for three days and he ascends to the Father. That day is coming when things will be known and things will be taught plainly. In that day, he says. And in that day, we notice uh, it's talking about the Holy Spirit of God because we notice in verse uh, uh, 20 of chapter 14, verse 23 of chapter 16, that it distinctly defines the Holy Spirit that came down at Pentecost. So what he refers to here in verse 25 distinctly points to the work of the Holy Spirit of God. So when he said that, I'm going to teach you plenty, I'm to continue to teach you, it is through the Holy Spirit of God. He's going to teach us. And so he's still doing that. He's teaching us That's through the word of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. I like that. He's still teaching. The Holy Spirit is the teacher. He is the Spirit of Christ and he will continue to teach. And he's still teaching teaching today. Think about it. Jesus at the right hand of the Father right now at this present time, but he's still carrying on his ministry of teaching through the Holy Spirit of God. 
And those of us who study the scripture, when you study the scripture, that's when the Holy Spirit really begins to work in your life and in your heart. It shows you and leads you and guides you into the things of, of the Lord. You want to know the Lord? Get into the Holy Spirit. I mean, get into the Scripture and, and get into the Holy Spirit and, and things will begin to be revealed to you. So the Spirit is continuing His teaching today. It's a magnificent thought though, to think about. Remember, uh, 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 think about this. That, that is a teaching. It's an open-end book. It continues and continues and continues. You know, you may go to college and you've done it four years. Years. You know, some may go a little bit longer. You know, some of you have to cram four years of college into five. But you know, but the Bible is an open end. In other words, you never learn it all. You can go to school and learn all kinds of things, and you graduate and you go on and perform those jobs. You've learned it all. But I want to tell you something. When it comes to Jesus Christ and the Lord and, and learning of Him and the ways of God, you never learn it all. It's an open book. In other words, it's a continuous learning. You never reach the pinnacle until God takes you home. Amen? Amen. So we're to keep studying. Think about it. But think about this. The Spirit of God plainly speaks the Word of God to our troubled and needful heart that we might walk through whatever trial we face in life. It is about walking through this life, serving God the best we can. That is the teaching. That is the guide. That is the help that we're getting from the Holy Spirit of God. Thank God for it. And not only this, there's, a, there's so much and many times that the Holy Spirit of God will show you things that He hasn't showed anybody else. Isn't that marvelous? Isn't that wonderful? I mean, I want to tell you something. If you're ready, a regular study or uh, uh, into the Word of God, you're going to see things. Things will be opened up to your eyes that you're going to go, wow, I never saw that before. Well, now, if you don't bother getting into the Word of God, it ain't going to happen. Back there where God was and, and, and bring the atonement for the sins of the whole nation of Israel one time a year. And he got in there and he got out fast line because he was scared to death and he didn't want to do anything wrong. He was in the presence of God. So that's what they were accustomed to. But Jesus is telling his disciples, he's telling them this. Hey, this is wonderful, guys. You can go straight to the Father. You can now go straight into Holy of Holies and you request from the Father in my name. And guess what? You've got the Lord's ear. We still have that today, amen? amen? We can go straight to God the Father in Jesus' name and seek whatever uh, we need in our life. But let me tell you this. It ain't about seeking selfish things, though, so I'm not talking about that. It's not about going to the Lord and asking for a Cadillac or a Mercedes or a big mansion or a big bank account. When you're truly wanting to serve God, it's about going to God and saying, God, whatever... I want this to glorify you. My prayers are to be about glorifying the Lord. That's the prayers that we take to God. Lord, if it'll glorify you, heal this person. If you can get uh, uh, glory uh, out of this, make this happen, God. That's what it's talking about. But this is really stunning to the Jewish people. This, this is really stunning. That God, Jesus said, look guys, you, you, listen, you could go to God now. Now, you could go into the Holy of Holies and they're going like, we're not used to this. We can go straight to the Father. Yes, the veil, it's, it's ripped open. You can go into the Holy of Holies. You have access. You have privilege. And folks, I want you to understand today, as children of God, if you're born again, washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, the veil, the door is open. You can go to God the Father in Jesus' name, and He will hear you. Amen? Amen. Prayer must be also practice of our lives each day. For, 
For it is the means that God uses to provide for us in the heat of the spiritual battles that we're going to face. We should never see prayer again as an emergency tool. But we ought to let our prayers arise every day, day after day, that the Lord provides for us in Jesus' name. We have the heart of God so long, or as long as we place before him the name of Jesus Christ, his son. In other words, when we come to the Lord God in the name of the son, we immediately have his heart. We have the heart of God exercised toward us because it is there. You know, that there's the father's love is in his son. There's nothing. That the father don't love any more than he does his son. And so when we come to him in the name of the son because of our unity with him, we have the assurance that God's heart is directed toward us when we come in his son. So to pray in Jesus' name means to come to the Father on the basis of all that Jesus is and all that he has done for us on the cross of Calvary. Don't forget about that. Go to God. You've got a need, go to God. Go to the Lord. And this is what Jesus says, so that your joy may be full. Amen. Prayer is about filling up your life with joy too. Your life full of misery. You're going through life and you're saying, man, That man preaching my life, I don't, I don't seem to have any joy. How was your prayer life? Lord Jesus said, the door's open for you to go talk to the Father in my name. And, and because you can do, do that, your life is going to be filled with joy. If you'll do that, so that your life will be full of joy. My second main point, we have hope. Be a good cheer. We have hope through God's love. It's interesting to note here in verse 27, the verse, that when we read, for the Father himself loveth you, the Father just, uh, 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 the Lord uses the term for love that means to have an affection for. It is the term phileo, in other words, not the term of agape. For the Father himself has affection for you. When you have affection for someone, it's because you have some, uh, some similarity. You have interest, you know. And you have that love. But the agape love, that, which is talked about so much in the New Testament, so often spoke about, is about a sacrificial love. And we see that in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God loves all, all people. And he gave his son for them. But there's a difference he's talking about here too. Christians. He's talking to his disciples. He's talking to those that belong to him and to the Lord. He, ha he has a, an affectionate love for them. You see, the love of affection is the kind of love that you have for an individual because you have a common interest or a common like. And in this case, for the Father Himself love you or has his affection for you. Why? The affection the Father has for us, he has for us because we and the Father both 
love the Son. Understand? So this love that I, I have and this love that I receive from God, is it something that, that the lost people receive? No. Yes, they have the agape love. God gave his life for them. But because we love Jesus and we give our heart and life to the Lord, and he's our everything. Because Jesus is everything to us, then guess what? We have that phileo love. In other words, we have that affectionate love. So God has a special affectionate love for you, child of God. He loves you. Isn't it wonderful? That he has an affectionate love, even though he loves he has an affectionate love, even though he knows me. He knows every bit of my faults and failures. He knows my weaknesses. He knows everything about me. He knows the spiritual battles that I face. Amen. And yet he has an affectionate love for me. How wonderful. How wonderful. Now, let me answer ask you this. Are you here today and can you personally say that God has an affectionate love for you? John 14 23 says, if anyone loves me, this is Jesus talking, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our abode with him. You know, there may be a lot of people who don't love me. And that's okay as long as God loves me. Amen. I'm okay. Amen. Amen. As long as I have that affectionate love of our Lord and Savior. As long as I have God's love, God the Father. I'm alright. What about you? Are you alright? Do you have that affectionate love of, of, of God? You say, preacher, what? That sounds wonderful. How, that, now tell me again, how do I, how do I get that affection? How would, how could I ever convince God to love me affectionately? He knows me. He knows everything I've done. He knows the sinner that I am. But how can I get that affectionate love from God? It's simple. Love His Son. Love His Son. That's how you get that affectionate. Love the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And when you love Him, God will love you. God the Father will love you. Yes. And when you've got the love of God, you've got it all. You've got that thing that will satisfy you. You've got that thing that will give you hope in life. You've got everything when you've got that affectionate love of God the Father. And how do you get it? Through loving God the Son. When you make Him everything, when you make Jesus everything in your life, God will make you everything to Him. You love Jesus, the Father loves you. It's that plain, it's that simple. You want to be loved today, love Jesus. And by the way, that's what it means to be a Christian. It doesn't mean to belong to an organization or a tradition. It means to love the Lord Jesus Christ, to love Him with a heart that leads to obedient service and worship and fellowship, giving your all to God. That's what it means to be a Christian. Loving Jesus and God loving you. The disciples here says that we believe that you came from the Father. Christ's heavenly origin is important, else he cannot be the Savior of man. But also his heavenly destination is also important, for it witnesses to the Father's seal and the Son's saving work. The Lord Jesus Christ has come. He has offered the atoning sacrifice. He went to the cross and there he has died. He gave his life wearing that crown of thorns and being pierced in the side by the, by the spear. He died in agony and pain with those nails in his head and his feet. The atoning sacrifice. He has poured out his blood under the judgment of God and he has paid the penalty and therefore heaven itself can bring, uh, can bring no further charge against those who believe in Christ Jesus. When you give your heart and life to him, I want you to understand you stand perfect before almighty God because you have the righteousness of Christ and there's no greater feeling. Amen. Amen. 
It is complete. It is secure. We have life. We have righteousness. And God the Father loves us with an affectionate love. Hallelujah. But it's also, it's also through the victory, through Christ's victory. We are destined for persecution and affliction as children of God. We don't have it right now, like many in the world. Folks, I want to tell you something. The literal meaning ain't telling you about all these Christians all over the world, especially now. What's happening in Afghanistan to the Christians. But it's not pretty. It's not a beautiful thing. They're dying. They're being beheaded. They don't care if they behead a pregnant woman. They don't care. They mean cruel. They're right from the pits of hell. They are. We have it pretty made here, but still yet we could face persecutions. It happens. Friends will turn their back on you. Companies will look you over, pass you over. You know, I, it's amazing. I, I get so frustrated. I look at the way the sports world treated Tim Tebow. All because he was a Christian. You know, they make fun of him for taking a knee. They don't make fun of that other jack leg that was down there in San Francisco in that gay city, took a knee for the wrong reasons. He was a hero, Tim Tebow. Is a, well, I'll just leave it at that. Folks, what I want to tell you is this. Don't be surprised, and we shouldn't be surprised. Because of the persecution and affliction that may come your way as a child of God. Now that's going to happen to you if you're living truly as a child of God. You're not trying to hide it. You're not trying to be ashamed of it. We're in a world and in the world we will have tribulation it says. And tribulation means essentially pressure, affliction, distress. You're literally going to be crushed. You're going to be per pressured. You're going to be in the pressure cooker of life. And there will be a time that you will fail God too. You ever failed God? Amen. Say yes. Yes. We all have. The disciples here are beginning to see some clarity though. They might not have fully understand everything yet, and they didn't, but they had some sense of truth, some sense of refreshment here. It says, and they believed there, and they believed that he was God in human flesh. They believed that he came from heaven, and they made this confession in verse 30. Then Jesus said to them, Do do you now believe? And then look what he says. He says, he says to them, you're, you're now going to run. You're going to abandon it just in a little bit. Just, it's not long. Maybe an hour at the most. You're going to abandon me. You're going to fail me. And you're going to fail God. And we've all been there. Then he says, I tell you this so that you might have peace in me. Now he looks at them and he says, you're going to fail me. You're going to run. You're going to abandon me. But I'm telling you this that you might have peace in me. In other words, he's telling, I'm telling you everything that you may believe that I am who I say I am. That you might get the peace and understanding who I am. And also this. I'm going to restore you. You're going to fail me, and in the, in the world, you're going to have tribulation. What does, again, that word world mean? World does not mean the physical planet. It means the system of evil that dominates the, uh, the creation and, and, and dominates humanity. I got, thing, I got so ill yesterday. You know what I, what I saw and I read? I found out. 
You know what the Biden administration is doing with this here, uh, where you get the antibodies to give that to you? Mm -hmm. For all those who have Republican governors, he's kind of cutting it. They don't get as many as everybody else. Now you tell me that ain't from the devil. He's putting people's lives at risk. That makes me sick to my stomach. All for political purposes. World does not mean the planet. It means evil, demonic, dominating the human race. It is the satanic operation infesting our sin world. Now as... As I'm saying this, I want you to understand, this is where you live. <coughs> this is where you are right now at this present moment, in a sin, demo a demonic dominated world. Amen. It's evil out there. Right. It's evil out there. But that's where we live, so we gotta grab reality. You live in this evil system. Evil dominates the world. The world is ruled by Satan. He's the, he's the ruler of this world, the prince and the power of the air and the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedient, which is just another term for sinners. So in the face of their failure because of the world's persecution, how can they win? How can we win? How can we have peace? Jesus said, be of good cheer, I have overcome. He has overcome the world. He's overcome the evil system. And this is the ultimate victory. The world will persecute you. The world will kill you, turn you again against you, uh, one another. But I have come to overcome the system. I come to overcome sin, Satan, and demons. I've overcome it all through the death, the resurrection. He has defeated it. His victory now, for a child of God, is our victory. We don't have to let the evil world dominate our lives because we have victory in Jesus. I like that song, don't you? Yes. Victory in Jesus. 1 John 5, 4 and 5 says this, For whosoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Paul said to this in Corinthians, we always triumph in Christ. He tells the disciples these things so that the spiritual failure would not be final. In other words, he's encouraging them. Look, you're going to fail me. You're going to let me down. But it's okay. I've overcome the world. Your victory is not in you, not in your victories, but in my victory. Amen. So if you're here today and you feel like, man, I've let God down. I'm not where I used to be. That's all right. Jesus is just like the father, the prodigal son. He's there waiting with open arms. And I want you to understand that if you fail God, you can come back. And I want you to know he won't give you a mouthful, uh, uh, just chewing you out. What he'll do is throw a party. Amen. Amen. If you'll just come back, his arms are open. He's ready to give you a party. So if you fail him, keep your head up. Every child that God has. These disciples failed him. But praise God. Look what happened. Look why God used these men. If it weren't for these men. I tell you we wouldn't have the word of God today. Would we? Right. For you see the Holy Spirit of God. That God sent. Used these men. Spoke to these men. Showed these men. Cleared up in their minds the things of God. And they wrote this blessed book. Amen. Amen. The four gospels and acts. The epistles. I want you to know I've failed, God. But I'm still going to heaven, not because of any victory of my own, but because God, Christ Jesus, gave me the victory. Amen. In spite of their failures, they are in Him, and so are we. But even though there are in the midst of tribulation, even though the trials are heavy and the darts are flying by them thickly, and fast, he says, in me you might have peace. In the world, you're going to have tribulations. In the world, your heart's going to be full of trouble. But you can be relieved by the peace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. How can we keep our sanity in a world that's going crazy? Through Jesus Christ. Amen? 
Now, I know the world looks at us and thinks we're crazy. That's all right. Hmm. I'd rather be a fanatic for Jesus than a fanatic of anything else. Amen. Do you want peace in your life? Do you want tranquility in the midst of turmoil? Do you want joy in your life? The positive experience to, to face life on the matter of how, no matter how difficult it may be? Then you need to be in the arms of a loving God, a God in whom you can trust, who's ready to give you eternal life and to care for you daily. A God that has the door stand there wide open and all you got to do is come to him in the name of Jesus. That your joy might be full. In this context, the Father's special love is for men who are about to fail spiritually. So the encouragement for them is, it, it, it fails. Be encouraged by Father's special love and grace for you. Look Again, at the Father's love for that prodigal son, Jesus and God in heaven above has that same love for you and ready for you to come home, even if you fail today. But where are you today? Let's go back to the beginning of the sermon. Do you have the affectionate love of God. The most important thing, the most important question you need to answer today is this. Do you have the affectionate love of God? That you've looked at John 3, 16 and realized that God gave the Son, His Son, to die on the cross for you. And all you have to do is accept that Savior, that one who died for you, and love Him. And there, there's how you get the affectionate love of God. Do you have the affectionate love of the Lord today? If not, your prayers are worthless. Your dreams, they're dead. Your hopes for joy will never come true. For satisfaction, <coughs> you see all that. Tranquility only comes through giving your heart and your life to Jesus. So there's the question. How's your affection? How's the affection of God in your life? Does he love you with affectionate love? Have you gone past that John 3, 16 where he gave his life and reached out to him? That's the most important thing. We look at the world situation today and it's getting worse, it's getting bad, it's getting terrible. And there's no hope for it getting any better. The Bible tells us that. I truly believe we're living in the last days. Yes. It's getting down to where the world thinks every man for himself and they could care less about you or anybody else, just what they can get today for themselves. But I want to tell you something Jesus cares about. God the Father wants to love you. And all you got to do is love His Son. It makes simple reasoning to me. When people love my family and my kids. I love them too. Amen? As we stand this morning, ask yourself, do you have that affectionate love of God in your life? If not, I would come to this altar. I would make it happen. You don't have to talk to me. No, no. You go straight to the Father in the name of Jesus. Tell him what's on your heart. Right now, as we sing. What are we singing, honey? Hymn number 491. 491. Will you come right now if God's speaking to your heart?
spirits, whatever God lays on your heart, you come on, whatever it is you need, it's all so Anybody else? 